Good morning and welcome to our service today. It's a special service that I am co-leading with Philip Dutton. I'm Reverend Sue Browning. I am the minister who is honored to serve the Unitarian Universalists of the Chester River and the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship with Easton. Today is a service where we are going to talk about lynching and we're going to talk about some of the ways in our current times we can acknowledge some very hard stories. It's about accountability and places that have gone unanswered for a long time. It is a chance to learn together. It is a chance to feel together. It's a chance to come together and be changed. And that ideally is what we do every Sunday. We come together with all of our experiences over the past week, over the past month, and see how we are processing it both individually and collectively. If you have questions about our, either of the congregations or if you have questions about Unitarian Universalism, please reach out and ask. Please let us know what your questions are and we'll do our best to answer. You can reach us through the website or give us a call. So welcome. I, as I mentioned, am co-leading the service with Philip Dutton, who is a member of the Unitarian Universalists of the Chester River. And he is gonna offer our chalice lighting words as I light the chalice this morning. Thank you, Sue. I ask you all to pay particular attention to the second line of the chalice uh, words today because we're talking about truth a lot. So just uh, think about that a little bit more. We light this chalice as a symbol of the light within all creation. We light this chalice for truth. May the search for truth be with us always. We light this chalice for love. May the love for others be strong in our hearts. And then if we could spotlight Philip, he's got our opening words today. So um, I'm reading words today from uh, South African Bishop Desmond Tutu's book, No Future Without Forgiveness. Uh, and these are words that we also used in a 2010 Truth and Reconciliation Ceremony at the Garfield Center in Chestertown that some of you were probably um, in attendance that day. <coughs> so from Desmond Tutu, Ubuntu, that's spelled U-B-U-N-T-U. -U. Ubuntu is very difficult to render into a Western language. It speaks to the very essence of being human. A person with Ubuntu is open and available to others, affirming of others, does not feel threatened that others are able and good. For he or she has a proper self-assurance that comes from knowing that he or she belongs to a greater whole and is diminished when others are humiliated or diminished, when others are tortured or oppressed or treated as if they were less than who they are. He goes on. In the spirit of Ubuntu, the central concern is the healing of breaches, the redressing of imbalances, and the restoration of broken relationships. Moreover, that restorative justice is being served when efforts are being made to work for healing, for forgiving, and for reconciliation. Reconciliation is liable to be a long, drawn-out process with ups and downs. But to work for reconciliation, is to want to realize God's dream for humanity, when we will know that we are indeed members of one family, bound together in a delicate network of interdependence. We now have, uh, let me find where we have. We now have our opening hymn, Spirit of Life.
Thank you, Philip, for your words and for your music. I invite us now into a time of reflection, a time of centering ourselves for a message, for a story, for learning. Spirit of life, spirit of love, God understood in many ways. We come together in awe and gratitude for the beauty all around us. We come feeling a turning of this time of year, a turning toward warmth. We come observing and feeling new life all around us. There is so much to be grateful for, so much in creation, so much beauty. And two, we come together this week, this month, in witness of struggle. This weekend, we know of another mass shooting in Indianapolis. Our hearts to extend to all experience in fresh loss in that moment. But we know it needs to be even broader than that. Many mass shootings, individual shootings, other violence. We hold in our hearts our frustration, our sadness, and our anger that again, we are lighting these candles. And we come together as a nation standing on edge. The trial in Minneapolis goes on, and we recall the death of George Floyd. We keep his memory alive as we go through the slow processes looking for justice. Many things are around us in the context of all the beauty and the creation and our personal joys and our personal struggles and sorrows. Take a moment for this reflection, for the gratitude, the concerns. May our hearts in this moment be renewed. May they be opened. May we be supported by one another. May all of our hopes, because our hopes can't get lost here, may they become reality with the time and patience and impatience it takes to move forward. May we each be changed one step at a time. Amen and blessed be. One of the ways that we build community week after week is by sharing our personal joys and sorrows as we acknowledge, it's, it's our acknowledgements of the heart and that is this time in the service. Um, when we have Zoom services, we can light candles and I will do so in a moment as our various hosts spotlight people and we can share joys and sorrows on some services like next week when we have a completely pre-recorded. We have a very exciting Earth Day service we're sharing with um, others in the country. Um, please let us know your joys and sorrows by email and we'll either include them the, week, the, the next week or we can um, mention them during coffee hour. So I'm gonna light our first candle um, for the many ways we've been impacted by the COVID virus. I know we've done it a lot and yet we need to hold a world death toll now of 3 million people. The struggles of our researchers, our medical folks, everybody trying to do the best they can and the reality that the losses and the challenges continue. And while I'm standing with the candles, I do light a candle for the many losses due to violence, particularly gun violence that we experience in our country. So I'm gonna go ahead and light those two candles. And after I've done that, I just ask um, those who are hosting today to call on folks for joys and sorrows. And I'm gonna go to my own gallery view so I can see who's speaking.
Okay, go ahead and call on folks as you see them. Let's just take a moment and hold the many joys and sorrows that are spoken and that remain in our hearts. We now will start the part of the service where we're going to learn about the James Taylor Justice Coalition. I can find my little piece of it. Hang on, give me one second. Okay. And Philip is going to start us off. We're going to do some basic learning. We're going to have some slides, and he's going to give us a brief reflection. And then uh, we, Philip and I, will share a interview we did with one of his colleagues, Paul Chu. So, um, and then we will move into some music. So at this point, I think if we can do the sh screen sharing and we move to Philip. And I'm just gonna go ahead and move out of the screen. Are we- and My screen it? says that the host has disabled screen sharing. Okay. For you? Dave Moore. Dave Moore is our screen sharer today. No pressure here, Dave. <laughs> Can you do what you need? So you can't, you need screen sharing capabilities. Unfortunately, Dave Moore does not have that file. You don't have that, but you need to give Philip screen give sharing. Me screen share. As a host, is Philip a host? No. Okay. Try, okay. I tried a setting. See if it works now. Hello. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> setting. All right. All right. So, um, if those of you who are viewing, um, if you click on the upper right hand corner um, and views side by side, choose side by side speaker under views. Hopefully you will see me in the left, in the right hand side of your screen and some slides in the other side. Okay, and if not, don't worry about it. You get the information you need. So in May 15th of 1892, a 12 year old girl was raped in a farmhouse in Kennedyville. Her dad was in the barn pitching up the, the wagon to go to church and her mother was, was ill and upstairs, unable to come down. This young girl said that it was James Taylor, a young black man who worked on the farm that raped her. There was also a white man working on the farm that day, but he said he was out in the field at the time. By the end of the day, James Taylor had been apprehended and taken to jail. The next day, the sheriff heard that there were rumors of lynching around the county. So he put Mr. Taylor and one other man who happened to be in the jail at the same time on a boat and sent them down the river for safekeeping. That night, a group of men in mass showed up at the, at the jail. The, the, the sheriff's son let them in to show them that Mr. Taylor wasn't there and they left. The next day, the county commissioners refused to pay the money that it would take to keep Mr. Taylor safe on the river. So the sheriff was forced to bring him back and put him back in jail in Chestertown. Institutional complicity here, folks. So the leaders of the lynchers the next day met on the 17th, met with some town officials. That's how they were described in the papers. Met with some town officials at a hotel on Spring Street. These town officials did not tell those lynchers not to lynch Mr. Taylor. They told them to take him out of town, to not lynch him in town. Again, institutional complicity and endorsement of this action. That night around nine o'clock or so, a mob of about 60 men with masks, weapons, and sledgehammers <clears throat> broke into the jail. At that, if you know where the parking lot is, right by the, the, the uh, county, county courthouse building, that's where the jail stood. They broke into the jail, tied a, a rope around Mr. Taylor's neck, dragged him out of the building and across the street. 
If you know where that driveway is, right between the law offices and the Park Row buildings, there's a, there's a parking lot there and a driveway that goes into the back. There's a cherry tree standing there now. That's about where that a small maple tree was hanging that night in 1892. And the crowd, um, the, um, the mob took Mr. Taylor over there. Newspaper reports said that there were 500 people witnessing this event. Can you imagine 500 people today witnessing an event in our town? They threw the rope over a limb in this small tree and, and hauled Mr. Taylor up and down, up and down until he was dead. The newspaper man from Baltimore happened to be in the jail and talked to Mr. Taylor before, before the lynching. And he says, I'm about to go to meet my maker, but I swear to you, I'm an innocent man. And within a few days, an, an inquest was held, and it was determined that Mr. Taylor died of hanging. But no one knew anyone associated with that event. There were no charges filed in the case. And Mr. Taylor was buried in an unmarked grave outside of town. So in January of 2019, we were in church one morning and Peggy Christie came up and, and gave me a copy of the Harvard Law Journal with an article in it about this man, Brian Stevenson, and the work he has done to find justice for uh, mostly men, black men who've been incarcerated um, wrongly. And also um, talk about his, the, the Equal Justice Institute that he created in Montgomery, Alabama. I was, I was really taken by the article and, and Lynn and I were planning to go to New Orleans, driving trip to New Orleans within the next few weeks. So we, we took a side trip and went to Montgomery and we, had, we went to see the, the um, Memorial for Peace and Justice or the Lynching Museum at, lynching memorial as it's called and also the legacy museum there in uh, in Montgomery. I was moved by that. Uh, if you ever have a chance to go there, I encourage you to do so. It's a powerful, powerful place. So I returned home and I called Peggy and I called Sumner Hall and Larry Wilson and Barbara Foster and said, you know, I think we need to think about creating a group to help um, promote um, the truth of what happened to James Taylor and to join the Equal Justice Inst Initiative in their community remembrance projects. As it so happened in January of 2019, which I didn't know at the time, Maryland, the Maryland legislature had passed unanimously a law that created the Maryland Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This is a commission that is um, empowered to investigate the 40 um, extrajudicial lynchings that occurred in Maryland and to propose reconciliation. So we created the James Taylor Justice Coalition. And these are, this is our mission. We're aligned with the Equal Justice Initiatives Community Remembers Projects. We want to shine the light of truth on the more than 4,000 extrajudicial lynchings of African-American people between 1877 and 1950. And only by telling the unvarnished truth about the past can we address these injustices against black and brown people today. The James Taylor Justice Coalition is, has been endorsed by the Town Council of Chestertown. We're part of the Chestertown Unites Against Racism effort um, we're also supported by the uh, Equity Advisory Commission or Council uh, that was created by the mayor to, uh, for 18 months of activities related to, um, uh, to racism in our, in our community. So our goal is that primed with the truth and past 
about the past and knowledge of the present, the people of Kent County and the Eastern Shore of Maryland will seek to under, undertake the changes in our society necessary to ensure justice and equality for all. Now I'll turn it back to Sue. I'll explain this slide later, uh, but I'll turn it back to Sue now. Thank you, Philip. Um, Philip and I wanted to bring in another voice because we are very aware we're a predominantly white congregation and how is this being understood um, in the broader community? You may need to spotlight me, but right now I think before we do that, we are going to now move to an interview that Philip and I did this week with um, Paul Chu, who is also active in the coalition. So Dave, we can screen share that interview now. It's a pleasure to introduce to you uh, Paul Tu this morning. Um, Paul and I have known each other for what now, three years or so, Paul? Yeah. Um, and I've come to respect him tremendously uh, and admire his work. Um, he was born and raised in DC. Uh, he's an inner city guy, uh, moved to Kent County 12 years ago. I'm sure that was quite a shock for him. <laughs> or to the Eastern Shore. He lives in Queen Anne. Um, the co-founder of the Bayside Hoyas, which is a youth, uh, youth a group that's devoted to uh, improving uh, youth participation, uh, mentoring, character building, all that sort of thing. They do a lot of basketball and other kind of sports as a, uh, a way to get two kids and, and, um, and reach them. Uh, he was also the initiator of the um, Feed the Children and Elderly program that the Social Action Committee started. Um, and he really was the, uh, the energy behind getting that going. Um, he was also um, dressed up in a pink bunny costume and uh, <laughs> was the Easter bunny when we took Easter baskets around the county. Now that's some extra duty there. Um, he, uh, Paul is a co-founder of the Monarius Dream Alliance, a new nonprofit uh, organization in our county that has taken over the food program and is doing other great work within the county. Um, he's a member of the James Taylor Justice Coalition, which is, is the um, capacity that he is speaking uh, to us today. Um, he's also the uh, Youth Football League Commissioner and Coach. Um, he has in, uh, initiated and created a college prep program for young black kids and uh, taken them on college tours and uh, that sort of thing. In, in general, Paul Tu is a creator. Um, he's a social service entrepreneur. And uh, I am delighted that we have him here today to, to talk about uh, James Taylor Justice Coalition and, and get his perspective on, on that effort. So thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I had the chance to ask our first question of Paul today. Um, Paul, you've been to our sanctuary in Chestertown. You know now this is a joint service with our Chestertown and Eastern congregations, and we are a predominantly white congregation. Why does it matter for a predominantly white congregation to be talking about lynching? Uh, it, it matters for a myriad of reasons. Um, I think one of the biggest reasons that it matters, and the most basic, it just gives the congregation and the people a chance to uh, actually put action behind words, to actually put uh, energy and effort and works behind words. I think that fundamentally, regardless to the denomination or creed, our religious institutes all are anti-racist, or they would like to think they're anti-racist. Um, they should be anti-racist. So getting behind this coalition and getting behind the efforts that, of the coalition, it just gives the congregation a chance to uh, really put that, like I said, energy, effort, and work into, into what the fundamentals should be anyway. Um, I think it's important if you go, if you look you know, through history, you can see it's been plenty of uh, white allies, white sympath sympathizers through churches. Um, a, lot of, a lot of awesome churches, participated in civil rights. A lot of, uh, you can go back further than that, a lot of white churches participated in, um, in helping fund and also execute the Underground Railroad. 
So it's just another chance in following that lineage. It's another chance for, the, for your congregation to, to do that, pretty much. Well, that that is is part of a hard story. I know this goes all the way back, um, as we heard earlier today, to 1892. So it's a part of history that is way back there. Why, for all, for all of us, for white, black folks of, of all colors, what is, well, why is it important to go back and understand these lynching stories? I think you have to, uh, that's a great question, but for me, um, you have to understand that history, you have to acknowledge that history, and that's the only way I feel like we can ever really heal and, and grow from that history. And I don't think we've done a good job in this country in, uh, in acknowledging it and, and, and atoning for it even. Um, so until you do that, how can we how can we not delve into it? How can we not be uh, and, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word? How can you with me when I read those stories and when I when I when I when I when I have conversations with people and I try to put myself in that place, I couldn't imagine the terror and the the, the helplessness that those people felt to know that uh, you could be accused of a crime and you wouldn't get a, a fair shake in court to know that a lynch mob could come snatch you out of the jails. You, you had police, you had sheriffs, you had people in charge of protecting you. And in a lot of these stories that we read about, um, you never, they never seen the courtroom. They, they, they could have been snatched from, from a jail cell, away in court and, and lynched and their lives been over. Um, and we haven't closed, we can't close that chapter until we fully acknowledge that those wrongdoings and, 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 and then we can move on. But until then, I think it's really important that we continue to push the envelope, so to speak, and have these tough conversations around the lynchings that took place in this country. What really strikes me is just even hearing, is as I hear you talk about it, to imagine the fear and to imagine not only those folks who were lynched, but the intimidation of the possibility of lynchings mm -hmm. just being in the community do you see that, that that legacy has impact on our current world? Some of the challenges that we've got on mass incarceration, police policing practices. Do you see a tie between what happened back then in the late 1800s and 19, earlier 1900s, the lynching stories, and what happens today? I think it's Talk totally. A bit about that. Yes, ma'am. I think it's totally tied together. In fact, we often say, in in some of my conversation circles, modern day lynchings. Um, when you, when you think about some of the stuff that's going on with the uh, with the way my community is policed, with the um, the alarming rates that black and brown people are uh, are killed by by law enforcement, they're they're modern day lynchings. These people essentially they're not having their day in court. Um, and they're killed. Their lives are taken the same way way back then. You didn't get your day in court and your life was taken. So I, that's a, and that's another point to the first part of the question of why it's still important to have these conversations and to be involved because they directly correlate. They, 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 they go hand in hand um, with, with, with mass incarceration and, 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 and more importantly, because mass incarceration, it destroys lives, it damages communities, true, but people are still alive, right? So Oftentimes, those those people they do come home after doing their sentences, um, even if they spent the better part of the prime of their lives incarcerated. But with the with the killings, um, they're more. It's it's no coming back from that. That kid Dante, he he's not going home. He was pulled over uh, for expired tags, I believe, and having air fresheners, the little trees in his windows. I have those same trees in my windows right now. I've never been pulled over a stop phone. But the point, he's not, he's never gonna go come go home. He's dead. And uh they they definitely tie hand to hand for me. And that's another reason why we got to continue to have this conversation and continue. That's why the coalition is so important. Um to 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 put light on these things that only that happened in our past, but are still happening. And I really feel like they will continue to happen until we face it as a country and until we really really acknowledge and, and and change up what we're doing it's not working yeah you used a really powerful word a, a few minutes ago you talked about atonement mm -hmm. when you think about 
what it means, and, and we acknowledge that we're in a predominantly white congregation, where is the power there of, of hearing the individual stories and better understanding lynching? Where, where does that fit in in helping us move forward in a way that's anti-racist? Um. I feel so the atonement and the acknowledgement that brings the closure <clears throat> that brings the the actually saying you know so two groups when you hear stuff like get over it or uh that happened way back then it didn't my i didn't do it my my, my dad didn't do it you know maybe my great great or however that looks um but it's no acknowledgement in that it's no atonement in that it's, it's almost making it feel like black people or or let's not I only gotta say black people it feels like the victim so whether that's Native American, whether that's Jew, Jewish people, whether that's uh, anybody that had an atrocity committed against their people, um, it makes them feel like they're less than or they're crazy. That, 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 that really wasn't that detrimental to you. Get over it, right? So if, 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 if I walk, if I see you in the grocery store and I bang into you with my cart, right? And, and I just keep on going. We go to another aisle and I bang into you again. To, to your ankle area with my cart. And you look at me and say, excuse me, sir, you, you banged into me twice now. No, no, it was, I, was, I was looking the other way. It was no big deal, get over. Then we get into the next aisle and I bang into you again. You're really gonna have a problem. You're really gonna have something to say to me, right? But on, let's go back to the second time I bang into you. You say, excuse me, sir, you, you bumped into me twice now. I apologize. I was distracted on my phone or my son, he pulled away from me, I was trying to get him. I'm acknowledging that. I'm atoning for that. We shouldn't have an issue after that. Yes? Right. Yeah. Right. So it's the same thing just on a, on a, on a way bigger scale because you're talking about a whole, a whole race of people who, who, you know, a lot of us don't feel like it's ever been any acknowledgement or, or sincere acknowledgement to, to what we have gone through. So. Right. Well, I am um, so grateful for the work of the James Taylor Justice Coalition. And I understand um, as we close out this part of our interview, what I'm hearing is a real need to let it sink into our bones, to let us understand not only what happened, but how it carries forward. And until we are understanding both the atrocity and the power of acknowledgement, we're going to be in a stuck place. I think that's so a perfect. I'm hoping, I'm hoping I've heard you in a way that the, this is part of why you're involved in the work. I know Philip's involved in the work and so many, not only in, in, on the Eastern shore, but throughout the country are, are doing some of this work to pull the pieces of the story together and to keep them in sacred trust as we move forward. So thank, thank you, you, Paul. And we look forward to our continued partnership as we tell these stories, do the education, and work toward truth and reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm going to borrow that phrase, that stuck place. That was a perfect phrase right there. I like that. Take care. Yes, ma'am. So Philip is now going to, so thank you, Paul. And um, I know these words are going to take whiles to sink in. Philip will now introduce our next um, music piece. It has an important history. 1939, a 23-year-old Billie Holiday walked up to the mic at West 4th Street's Cafe Society in New York City to sing her final song of the night. For her request, the waiters stopped serving and the room went completely black, save for a spotlight on her face. And then she sang, softly in her raw and emotional voice. Southern trees bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. This was how Billie Holiday performed strange fruit, which she would do determinedly for the next 20 years until her death at the age of 44. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics Commissioner Harry Anslinger was determined 
to silence Holiday from singing that song. Anslinger was a known racist and believed that drugs caused black people to overstep their boundaries in American society and that black singers who smoked marijuana created the devil's music. When Anslinger forbid Holiday to perform Strange Fruit, she refused, causing him to devise a plan to destroy her. Knowing that Holiday was a drug user, he had some men frame her for selling her and by selling her heroin. And when she was caught using the drug, she was thrown into prison for a year and a half. In 1959, Holiday checked herself into the New York City Hospital, suffering from heart and lung problems and cirrhosis of the liver due to her decades of drug and alcohol abuse. Still bent on ruining the singer, Anslinger had his men go to the hospital and handcuff her to the bed. Although Holiday had been showing gradual signs of recovery, Anslinger's men forbid doctors to perform other treatments and she died within a few days. In 1999, Time Magazine designated Strange Fruit as the song of the century. And it's been credited with sort of starting the civil rights movement in many ways. The story of Billie Holiday and Strange Fruit is now depicted in a Hulu movie which I highly recommend. It's called The U.S. versus Billie Holiday. Now Karen Somerville, who has sung for us at UUCR many times, will sing Strange Fruit. Yeah. <laughs> 
Gratitude to Karen for stepping into that role this week at our request. We hold that as part of our learning. Philip is now gonna spend a couple of minutes and talk to us about some next steps and then I'm going to do a brief reflection. And um, for those who have the outline, we're gonna go ahead and skip uh, a, uh, one of the, la the last hymn, um, it was something we were reusing, and then we'll move right into the announcements. Um, being, so we have time to hear Philip's presentation here. Thank you. Um, I said I'd mention, uh, talk about this, this slide a little later. Um, this is a wall in the museum in um, Montgomery, Alabama. And these names are the people are people who had been identified by the Equal Justice Initiative who have been lynched in the United States between those dates. Um, these jars are filled with soil from the location or approximate location of where those lynchings took place. And they are done, uh, they're taken you know, by families, um, organizations like the James Taylor Justice Coalition um, uh, have, have done these soil collections as well. I'm going to tell you a little bit now about um, there we go about um, about the work that we're doing at James Taylor Justice Coalition and how you can get involved. Um, so, uh, in order to, to align with EJI, you have to take on a, a, a big education and engagement initiative. Uh, that's their requirement. You just can't go and collect some soil and be done with it. They require um, significant work to inform the public. Um, today, what we're doing today is part of that. So um, our mission is, is educating this community about what happened to James Taylor and to you know, about 6,000 other people actually from, from the end of the Civil War until 1950, we were lynched. And we will be um, doing outreach and um, an education over the next several months, probably next year or two. Um, coming up uh, on May 1st, there's a window display that will be at the Historical Society at High and Cross Streets um, that will talk about the, the lynching of Mr. Taylor and EJI. I encourage you to go and uh, see that ex ex um, display in the store. And while you're standing there, turn around and look across Fountain Park at Park Row and think about 500 people out there in 1892 witnessing the lynching of Mr. Taylor. On May 15th, um, we will be having the first Justice Day. Sumner Hall is sponsoring the Justice Day. Hopefully we'll be having these every year, but at some time around the, the anniversary of the lynching of Mr. Taylor on, on May the 17th. We are really excited about having Sherry Lynn Eiffel as our first speaker uh, at Justice Day. Uh, Sherry Lynn Eiffel is Gwen Eiffel's sister. Um, she was the president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and she wrote a book called On the Courthouse Lawn, which is about lynching on the Eastern Shore. Uh, Savannah Shepard uh, will also join us that day. Savannah is a college freshman who, when she was 16 years old, attended the dedication of the memorial in uh, Montgomery and came back dedicated to um, to memorializing Mr. George White, uh, the one individual who was lynched in Delaware. And she did that. She's an inspiring young woman. We will also have a summer book reading to read on the courthouse lawn. Uh, and I encourage you to read that book. It's, it's, it's a fascinating read. Also part of the, um, the work that we do is an essay contest. So in September, um, high school students in Kent County will be uh, offered the opportunity to write essays. And uh, EJI will give us $5,000 in prize money to give to the winners of that. This is a group of essay contest winners from Tennessee. 
just to show you, uh, you know, the, the process that we go through. They get plaques and money, cash. Uh, this young woman over here um, is Bree Lampkin. She's our representative at the Equal Justice Initiative. We will also have a Juneteenth celebration. Um, Sumner Hall uh, will be involved and the James Taylor Justice Coalition will participate in, in that as well. And in the fall, uh, we have a date yet, but we're hoping to have our own uh, soil collection ceremony, uh, a public ceremony here in Chestertown. So you can keep your eye out for that. You can get involved with us by joining any of these activities. Uh, you can actually join our coalition. We have monthly meetings and we can always use extra help um, spreading the word and, and with the events that we have coming up. Finally, these are some of our partners, the organizations that have formally joined our coalition. We are continuing to recruit coalition partners. And if you know of any organization who might be interested in joining our coalition, please recommend this to us. Thank you. So I wish um, at this point we could all show our gratitude for Philip um, in the way we would in person. But please, Philip, I know how much work it took to put together the presentation and the ongoing work. My so pleasure. thank you. So I, I, I know the group that's here is incredibly appreciative. And I did just move my computer because it turns out the sun does move around the room in odd ways. So just a couple Final thoughts, and then we do have some announcements today and um, a little bit wrap up on the stewardship campaigns. So when I started first hearing about these lynching stories, it felt like it was one more really important thing to add to our work of dismantling racism. But there were so many others. There are so many other ways that we have been trying to think out what do we need to do for healthcare, for education, financial institutions, what about addressing food security, and so many things that are in the community. What went through my head is, do we have time for telling this history well, this telling of lynchings, and then do we have time? Do we have emotional capacity? Do we have everything that goes with it? to make time to own the impacts of these stories. It even went further in my mind as I started asking questions, could this be a distraction? Could this be one more thing to study? And then we missed doing some of the other local work that matters. So I started going back to Brian Stevenson. I think folks know I'm a big fan of his and, and often look to his, some of his principles. And I stumbled on podcasts. There are 2000, a lot of them around 2017 when the Equal Justice Initiative work was getting started. These podcasts are free, are about five minutes each. They are the stories of descendants telling the stories. And they're, they're, needless to say, powerful stories when you talk about a lynching. And then they tell what the impact on the families were. How the lynchings contributed to mass migrations of people who had no desire to leave their local community where they had a job, where they had something accumulated, and yet they, they needed to flee. They didn't feel safe. So we hear about stories of these lynchings and they happened right here in, Mel in Maryland. And one of the important, most powerful pieces that Philip mentioned is nobody was then held accountable for going outside of the systems, doing murders. They couldn't somehow find witnesses, even though there were dozens or 500 or in cases, 10,000 people. Nobody knew supposedly what had happened. And I think that's what Paul Chu was trying to talk to us about when it comes to accountability. For those of us that have different roots from the North, there was a lot of looking the other way. There was a lot of places where federal laws could have stepped in and folks did not. So for those of us who are white, we're living way later than those who had set up the noose and brought the guns and cheered. 
But we, my folks, my friends, we have a choice to make. We can say what's done is done and we'll work in the aftermath. We'll work on today's inequities. But if we do this, if we do this and we skip the history and the accountability for the history, we are unlikely to be effective partners in the current work of moving toward equity. The legacy of lynching can't be ignored. Its ongoing effects are too great. I look at the work in Talbot County to move the monument, and, and we hear sometimes that's just a symbol. But we've got to be strong enough to work in parallel, to work on both the local issues and to do it, carefully weaving in the history. At the beginning of our service today, Philip read the words of Bishop Tutu. Reconciliation is liable to be a long drawn out process with ups and downs, but to work for reconciliation is to want to realize God's dream for humanity. When we will know that we are indeed members of one family bound together in a delicate network of interdependence. So we close knowing that not everything can be a priority all at once, and yet we have to weave both of these stories together. We have to feel the stories, we have to feel the risk, and to look at the ripple effects in intimidation, in fear, and how so much of our current world operates. And yes, we, those who are here now, need to do the work of acknowledging and making amends in forms we don't yet always understand, but that we need to commit to. It is a part of moving toward what is right. May it be so, and blessed be. So for today's story, um, I'm going to go ahead. We're going to, uh, I want folks to imagine what we had right here was the hymn, There is More Love Somewhere. Maybe we can um, offer it even after we have our sung benediction. But I think in the interest of both times and in the interest of letting Karen's rendition of Strange Fruit be the music we hear today, um, I'm going to move us to announcements. We then have a story of why two members are members um, of the Easton congregation, which I think ties the work together here. And then we'll have our closing words. So Christina, if you want to offer us our announcements, that would be great. And um, David, I think you. you had announcements for Chester River. You were going to go first. Yeah, let me uh, see if I can do this. Yeah. What a service, you know, it almost takes my breath away. I was going to do these announcements and I thought it's like, these announcements seem so trivial compared to what you guys are doing, what we've heard today. But anyhow, um, so you, you see our, uh, just finished their stewardship campaign a couple of weeks ago and it was a great success. Uh, thanks to, uh, Jim Lavin and his, uh, his crew. Uh, we're looking at a, establishing a task force to open up the church. We, um, it's not gonna happen this summer. You know, but we wanna get prepared for the fall. But we are having a few uh, things that we're gonna have in our parking lot again. The first of May, I don't know whether you call it Cinco de Mayo or May Day, but uh, Jim Ramsey and his staff are, are gonna have an outside activity and hope everybody can come to that. Um, we have a, we're looking at, we have a, uh, a task force for to look at leadership development so that we can present you with a slate of officers and the budget at our annual meeting uh, mid to uh, late May. And uh, once you, everybody, you UCR know that um, the great uh, building and ground staff and uh, everybody is keeping us, keeping the church going and we'll be ready for you in the fall. Good luck. Thank you, David, for those words, because I agree. It, it seems um, trivial to make some of our routine announcements after the um, powerful service that we just heard. 
Um, that said, I will move forward quickly so that we can hear our closing music. And I'm joined here with Eve. Together, we're gonna do the weekly announcements for UUFE. I'll start. Next Saturday, April 25th, UUFE will have an outdoor coffee hour at 12 noon. We hope to see you there in person. We are excited to invite you to a super cool virtual game night fundraiser. Saturday, May 15th, get your party pack, get your game on, mark your calendars for May 15th. Check out the newsletter this week for more details. So again, that's a virtual game night fundraiser May 15th that we hope you all can join us for. And then last, we'd like to thank everyone who sent in their annual pledge as part of our spring stewardship campaign. It's not too late if you'd still like to pledge your financial support to help with our annual expenses at UUFE. UUFE only exists because you make it so. I'd like to turn things over to Catherine Bender and Rob Forloni who have um, made a statement they'd like to share with you for why they think UUFE is important enough for them to pledge their financial support to. I'm Robert Forloni. And I'm Catherine Bender. And we're here to tell you what the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship at Easton means to our family. The UUFE is my spiritual home and community. It welcomes independent thought and the questioning mind. It both fosters and facilitates spiritual growth through the open and tolerant hearts and minds of its congregants. Intentionally welcoming to all people, regardless of background or personal identity, it reminds me that we are part of a larger community. On Sunday mornings, I will look around the congregation and I am filled with love as I see myself in all the faces, the personal struggles and the joys we all share in one caring community, UUFE. It is for this reason that I volunteer my time, energy, and money in support of this community. When we were having children, it was important to us to identify a community of like-minded individuals that had characteristics and values that we shared. We were looking for an organization that strive for social justice, values diversity, protects our natural environment, and also cares for one another. UUFE fit all of these roles. One of the things that we want to emphasize for our children is the importance of welcoming questioning minds, diverse identities, and expansive hearts. UUFE provides the opportunities for our children, as well as for ourselves as adults, in a multiple of different ways through RE, affinity groups, social justice efforts, and a variety of other opportunities to have conversations with individuals who welcome diverse identities and groups. We want it to be a beacon for independent thought, progressive change, and spiritual growth. It's important to us at UUFE to serve in a leadership position in the Midshore region and to identify what we can do specifically in our rural community. It's for these reasons that we and our family devote our time, effort, and resources in order to support UUFE at Easton, and we look forward to meeting you there at some time in the future. Thank you for the announcements and for the witness. It's part of witnessing. I know I ran into the vendors yesterday. I was out on a walk and I ran into the vendors and we were talking about the power of witnessing. And they are offering that as we each do to the many ways we are together. And so before our closing words, I do want to say that those announcements, that testimony, all the work it takes to keep a community together means that we are here together to hold a service and discuss a hard topic like lynching. It happens because we're here. It happens because we gather every week to try to make sense of our world. So I'm going to extinguish the chalice. I guess it's, it's almost in the, in the picture here. Um, we'll then have our sung benediction and we will move into coffee hour we close today with very simple words from Brian Stevenson. Always do the right thing, even when the right thing is the hard thing. Go in peace, go in love, go knowing love surrounds you wherever you may go. We now have our benediction. Oh, lift it.
bless your way.